me know where to start. No hurry. Okay, all right. So, good afternoon. And uh, we, this is going to be my second lecture uh, on white dwarfs. Maybe there will be one more or half more or something like that. We'll see when we come to the end of this lecture. So, the last time I first described to you uh, the concept of white dwarfs, <coughs> and then we, uh, I told you how they were first discovered and uh, how easy it is to find them in the modern times. And then we went on to the theory of white dwarfs, which I started. So, I'm going to continue along uh, that line today. So, uh, let me quickly recapitulate what I did the last time here. <coughs> So we considered uh, we considered uh, the <coughs> equation of hydrostatic equilibrium because a star like the sun, which is uh, in the process of nuclear fusion, uh, it is uh, quite hydrostatic. It is hydrostatic equilibrium. The size does not change, uh, either expand or contract significantly at all, and that is because of a balance between the inward force of gravity and the net outward pressure acting on any element. And that is described by the simple equation, dp by dr is equal to minus g m rho by r squared. So then, uh, then you have, uh, I showed you how one can simplify this by approximating dp by dr by pcr and so forth. And that led us along, we also take the perfect gas equation of state, and that led us to the very nice relation that the central temperature is equal to about 20 million times m by m solar and r by r solar to the minus one. So the last time uh, during the question and answer session, I was asked this very uh, important question. So why is it, why am I normalizing all these things to solar mass? Why can't I just plug in the numbers and get the relationship I want? So just imagine uh, going back to this equation. Uh, and I said, I just plug in the parameters for the sun and you do it and you'll get some answer. And then supposing I say that, no, you do it for Sirius or you do it for Procyon or any one of these other stars. And then you'll have to again put in the mass, you'll have to again put in the radius and again do all the horrendous calculation. But the way it is now, uh, so if I, if I, M is equal to M solar, R is equal to R solar, the temperature is 20 million Kelvin. But then if I if I double the mass, I know what happens. If I half the radius, I know what happens. So any combination of mass and radius, so long as the physics is the same as the physics of the sun, there'll be no problem. You can immediately do the scaling. So that is a very important thing, that uh, you should always write an equation in such a form that all the, the, the work of evaluating the same constants again and again is done once for all. And then you put the equation in a form in which you get in, insight into what is happening. I'll, I'll again demonstrate this in just a couple of slides on. And then we consider the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so there in the in the Boltzmann distribution, what happens is that we have, sorry, just uh, <coughs> let me minimize this. Yes. Okay, so uh, in the Boltzmann distribution, uh, this is for the distribution number of electrons. And the curve here is the kind that you see. The lower the temperature, the the more the curve <coughs> moves along this. Uh, this is the on this you have got uh, the molecular speed, let us say. So the lower the temperature, uh, the lower would be the speeds. Uh, I'm sorry. As the temperature lower, this is 1000 Kelvin, this is 600 Kelvin, this is 300 Kelvin. So the lower the temperature, then overall speed goes down, and then so there's a contraction towards low speeds. For any given temperature, the maximum in the momentum occurs at this point here. The average energy per particle is equal to 3 by 2 kT, which is independent of the mass. So if you consider a gas of protons, then again the temperature average, average energy will be 3 by 2 kT. And uh, so this is what you know the equation here. And then the, the, the pressure itself, uh, P is equal to nkt, uh, can be written as rho kt by mu mp, where mu is now uh, the uh, molecular weight. And to be exact, 
this should not be MP here. It should be what is known as the atomic mass unit. I use MP because it, it is, the MPs all aggregate together very easily then. Then we have, uh, then we went on, we considered an atom and the size of the atom is about 5 to 10 to the minus 9 centimeters. That is by definition the Bohr radius. And then we have got the size of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Right, and then we went on uh, to consider a gas with a given density rho. And if it is a pure hydrogen gas, this is the number density of particles. But you can get any kind of gas by just sticking in a mu here. And then uh, I showed you that the average distance between the particles is equal to n to the minus 1 by 3. So if you know the density, then you know the average distance between the particles. Right, so now we write down this equation. Again, you see that I have normalized it to the sun, for example. Okay, so then <coughs> uh, to solar values. So actually in the interior of the sun, m is equal to m solar, r is equal to r solar. So you get on an average, the particle, the, particle, the, <coughs> the distance between two particles is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And you will find that it is, uh, so this is uh, greater than the Bohr radius. Whereas if I consider uh, m is equal to m solar and the radius is equal to 100 the radius of the sun, which as I have told you the last time at length is the average radius of a white dwarf. Okay, then you'll see that if, if, I, if you stick those in, you will find that L is less than the Bohr radius. Okay, but it is uh, greater than, it is greater than <coughs> Then to the minor than the nuclear radius. So what do you mean? Uh, what is the implication of the average distance between particles being less than the Bohr radius? Is that if you go on, uh, if you take a, a star and you go on squeezing it, as you squeeze it, the density increases, the number density increases, so the average distance between the particles decreases. And when that average distance becomes comparable to the Bohr radius, the atoms are actually touching each other, at which point uh, you, you no longer have the concept of a uh, one electron going out, one proton, and then uh, the pressure is also very high at that time. And then the, in effect, the electrons get dissociated from the protons. So when that happens, uh, then of course, now uh, you, are, you, are, you, can, you can get into a completely different regime. And so, because you have got a plasma there. Now, uh, now we come to uh, the electron momentum. So you have got energy and momentum non-relativistically are related by this simple equation. And you know, we already see that the average energy is 3 by 2 kT. <clears throat> so it gives you, as t but we know from a, a diastatic uh, equilibrium equation, that T goes as G M M P by KR, so which gives you that P square is equal to this particular value here, 3 G M M P M E by R. Right, so now, <clears throat> now you know that, uh, so, so let's consider a, a particle, <clears throat> we are considering an electron in particular. So, <clears throat> so what happens is that now we, now the distances between the electrons is L, and you know that the momentum P is P, which you already calculated in the previous slide, and therefore the phase space volume. So what is the phase space volume? It is delta X into delta P, right, in one dimension, or delta X cube, delta X by delta P cube in three dimension. That's the phase space volume. So I got here uh, <coughs> the phase space volume, which using the equations, using the expressions we already derived, okay, can be written as by putting in all the fundamental constants as 500 times HQ, M by M solar, R by R solar. Right, so, uh, so again, uh, for a star like the sun, both these uh, factors are unity, and which would mean that the phase space volume is 500 times the cube of the Planck constant. So there's no problem. But on the other hand, for a white dwarf, so this becomes 0.5 times h cube. So do you see that? 
So again, uh, see the beauty of the scaling relations. I can straight away jump from a normal star to a white dwarf. And when I do that, uh, so you'll see that it means that the phase space volume, or if I, I can even consider just L into P for convenience, it's 0.5 H, which means that it is, it is smaller than the Planck constant. Right? So therefore, what does it mean? Is that it must be obvious to all of you that once this happens, so you need to bring in quantum mechanics. Right? Because your dimensions are becoming comparable to the Planck constant, of course, with the proper units. Okay, so therefore you need to bring in quantum mechanics. So the classical mechanics uh, can no longer be used. So when I when I got, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so when I got uh, when I have these uh, when I start making a white dwarf, we are not yet come to how a white dwarf is formed. But you squeeze a star, go on squeezing it. Then first the atoms start touching each other at which point the protons and the electrons are separated. Then this, you've got an ionized plasma. Then you are still going on squeezing it. And then the interparticle distance will start becoming smaller and smaller. And becomes. then you've got the whole thing is going comparable. The phase space is becoming, volume is getting comparable to the black volume per particle. And therefore, now you, you are now going to apply quantum mechanics. All right. <clears throat> So now we uh, go, uh, now I'll take you uh, through uh, basically uh, a series of derivations where I'll be doing the following. And uh, please follow what I do very carefully because I'm going to use a lot of scaling arguments, but I will later on, uh, if not in this lecture, in the next lecture, I will show you how these calculations can be done very exactly. And that of course was first done by Chandrasekhar, uh, when he was in his early 20s, entirely working by himself. Right, so now let us uh, look at uh, this thing here, is that I got a phase space shell between with a radius, momentum, radius between P and P plus dP. So so, so you see that in, in space, in the, in the momentum space, I got a radius P, so the momentum P, and I'm considering the number of phase space cells momentum cells between P and P plus DP. So what is the volume between P and P plus DP? The two shells, as you know, it is four pi P square, which is the which is the surface area of in momentum space of the sphere. And when I multiply by DP, I get the I get the volume of the momentum shell. And then when I multiply it by DV, which is the volume in, in, in computation space, uh, then I get, uh, then I'll get the total phase space volume is four pi p square dp dv, and uh, and then when you have got this phase space volume, what is the number of quantum states which are available? This is not quantum shells; is the number of quantum states. That's equal to four pi p square dp dv divided by h cube. This is just elementary quantum statistics, right? So now. Uh, Pauli's exclusion principle tells you that there cannot be more than one electron uh, per phase space element. Right? So that is Pauli's exclusion principle. But it, it also says that there can be, uh, actually the number of states available is equal to uh, this one, 4 pi p squared by h cube into 2, where 2 is uh, y2, so that is be <coughs> because the maximum number of electrons per shell is equal to this one into two, because electrons can have a, a, a spin up state and a spin down state, right? So, uh, so the number of ele the electron distribution function, there's a number of electrons with momentum between p and p plus dp and in the volume dv. So that is equal to. Uh, uh, so here uh, and now this one. The real it must be less than or equal to eight pi p square by h cube dp dv. Right. So what is this fp here? It is just the electron distribution function. And classically, what are the function that we use? We use the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. But here it doesn't matter what distribution that you use, but you must say that the number of electrons have this strong upper bound by Pauli's exclusion principle. 
So let us look at the diagram. What it says here is that <clears throat> now this one here is uh, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution now for rather high temperatures. So this is a million Kelvin, this is 10 million Kelvin, and this is 5 to 10 million Kelvin. Right? So, <clears throat> and this is P here on this axis. So this is exactly the curves that I plotted, I showed you uh, a few slides ago. And the red line here is this one. Right, so, so the red line is the function of this, this particular function here. You, you see the red line. So what does Pauli exclusion principle require you to do? It requires you to have the distribution which is below the red line. Otherwise, you are, otherwise you are violating Pauli's exclusion principle. Now look at this distribution with t is equal to 5 to 10 to the 7. You will see that it is almost wholly below the red line. Whereas as I decrease the temperature, uh, you see that here it is being violated, meaning that in this part of the curve, I can no longer, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is no longer tenable there. Okay, and then you have got here at, at even lower temperature. So you see that the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is quite grossly violated. So then, uh, <clears throat> then you say that what am I going to do? And if it is going to be violated, what is the correct distribution? Right, so I'm sure that all of you know the answer. And therefore, in, in the quantum domain, the distribution for electrons, which are spin up particles, and therefore which are Fermi particles, the distribution to be used is a Fermi Dirac distribution. So if this was spin zero particles, or, uh, or if there were even spin particles, uh, like photons have one, okay, then you would uh, use the Bose Einstein distribution. But these are Fermi particles, and therefore we have to use the Fermi Dirac distribution. So I hope uh, you have followed my arguments so far. I take it you from a normal stellar density to wide dwarf uh, density, material densities, and I have shown that uh, there uh, the classical uh, uh, the classical regime is no longer tenable. You need to go into uh, into the quantum regime, and then we have used the Pauli exclusion principle to show that the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is not tenable. And fortunately, we already know what is the correct distribution and which is the fermi dirac distribution. But let us take uh, this intuitively, I mean, the, uh, slowly, rather than jumping into the fermi dirac distribution. And uh, what have we got here? So let us consider the extreme case of absolute temperature is equal to zero. Now, you know that absolute temperature is equal to zero in classical thermodynamics would bring all matter to complete rest, the state of zero energy. And you also know uh, that that state can really not be reached at all because there'll be big trouble if you reached it and you can show thermodynamically that you cannot reach that state. Right? But here, uh, we are in a completely different regime. We don't have to worry uh, about T is equal to zero. Because what happens is that uh, classically all the electrons would collapse to P is equal to zero. But here that is not possible because we know that as the collapse starts in momentum space, the inner parts of the momentum space will get filled. And then therefore, the, then you have to put the electrons in the outer part and then you put further electrons in the outer part. So the electrons necessarily acquire non-zero momentum. Right? So, uh, but uh, because we are talking about T is equal to zero, uh, which is uh, which is a state of minimum energy, so we pack the electrons in such a way that they have absolutely minimum energy, which is consistent with the Pauli exclusion principle. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? You say that the electron distribution or the momentum, you say that it is equal to 8 pi P squared by HQ. Just one moment, please. So, uh, what would be the state of minimum energy here is that I start filling up. So, this is P. So, I start filling up all these states. And how far do I go? I will finally end up at some maximum state, the maximum momentum Pf, when all the electrons are accounted for. So, what is the 
moment of distribution function there. That is equal to 8 pi p square by h cube. So because you remember that per unit dp, it is 4 pi p square, which is the which is the surface area of the shell. And then I can multiply by 2 because of the two spin states and then divide by h cube. This is for p smaller than or equal to pf. And this is equal to 0 for p greater than pf. So what is pf? pf is known as the Fermi momentum. And x is equal to pf by mec. So I'm just introducing the distribution x. So you see that the, it is not as if the Fermi momentum is being given to me. There is, there is no, there is no uh, just one unique Fermi moment. What happens is that it is the other way around. Meaning that if I integrate this function fp over dv, then I can get the, the number density of particles. And then that turns out to be 8 pi me cube c cube upon 3 h cube into x cube. Then an x is equal to p of by b c. So if you tell me uh, that a white dwarf uh, has got uh, as a white dwarf has, has a mass m, then I can convert that mass to an average density. I can convert that to average number of particles. Uh, if it is just a pure hydrogen white dwarf, uh, then it is just uh, it's, it's that it will be rho by mp, but for any other chemical composition, it will be rho by mu mp. Right, so any. So given the any, then I know what is x, and therefore I know what is the Fermi momentum. And um, what is the momentum p? Um, I mean, I have, I have not shown you the details of this. Um, I'll indicate to you, I'll indicate them to you the next time because I want to just continue this train of thought. The momentum p turns out to be pi m e 4 c 5 upon 3 h cube into this function fx. And what is this function fx? It is equal to x. It is, it is this thing that you see here. And it just comes out of a simple integration, something which can be done exactly. So then what have we got? So you see, uh, if I, <clears throat> I got the equation of state for a fully degenerate micro for fully degenerate white dwarf matter. And what do I mean by full degeneracy? Full degeneracy means that there are no uh, there are no non-degenerate electrons because the temperature T is equal to zero. So somebody asks you what is fully degenerate matter, you just say it is matter at temperature, absolute temperature is equal to zero. And which is described by quantum mechanics in the way that we have done. Now what is an equation of state? An equation of state tells you that given the number density of particles and the temperature, what is the pressure? For a perfect gas, we know that P is equal to NKT. Right? So because you are given me N, you are given me T, therefore I can tell you what the pressure. Here, the temperature is equal to zero. And how do I find the pressure? You give me any number density of electrons. Then I invert this equation to get X. Then I, it, then I introduce that x into this fx. And then I put in that fx here. And then you see that I get the I get the pressure. Therefore, these two together constitute the equation of state for fully degenerate matter. Now, what happens if uh, the matter is not fully degenerate? And what do you mean by the non degenerate See, in general, in general, the Sorry, I have to shift this around. So in general, <clears throat> you have to use the Fermi Dirac distribution. Fp dp dv is equal to this quantity here. And then you've got E by kT and psi is a degeneracy parameter. Now just see what happens if uh, <clears throat> psi goes to infinity. Okay, so then this becomes E to the minus infinity, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is zero. And therefore, you have got Fp is equal to, eight, it is just this expression that we have got here. So psi, psi tends to infinity uh, corresponds to full degeneracy. And then uh, if you have got, uh, if this becomes negative, uh, then then what happens is that you, you get a maximum Boltzmann distribution. And for intermediate values of psi, so then you have what is known as partial degeneracy. I'll explain to you some of these concepts as we go along a little bit. So here is the curve 
the poly exclusion curve, 4 pi p square. And uh, the blue line here indicates if, if it were, if t is equal to zero, okay, then you have got, uh, you have got all the momentum states occupied before below pf and none occupied beyond pf. And then you see that for partial degeneracy, which means that for finite temperature, and then you see that here, uh, <coughs> so here the matter is degenerate and then as the momentum increases, you have filled in all the, some of the interior momentum states, but when you go outside, and then some states are filled, some states are not filled, and then you'll get what is known as partial degeneracy. So if it is, uh, <coughs> And, and for the right condition, this will become a fully a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. All right. <clears throat> now we want to consider two approximate cases. Because I, I showed you what is the general expression for... Uh, <clears throat> I showed you the general expression for these uh, objects. Now, we consider uh, two cases here. Now, understand these cases well. Now, x is equal to p of pi v c. So, what happens when x is much greater than 1? Then all the momentum values are much less than mvc, which means that it is a non-relativistic gas. So far, we are, not, we are not worried about the magnitude of the momentum or how fast the particles are moving. But if we, if we consider a case where x is much less than 1, then it becomes a non-relativistic case, whereas x much greater than one. So it means that all the uh, <coughs> all the, the, the momentum is uh, greater than mEc, uh, and therefore it becomes a relativistic gas. The particles are all uh, the particles are all moving close to the speed of light. It's a relativistic gas. So in the limiting case, uh, x much much less than one, which is x tends to zero. You can you can very easily work out that the function f x goes as x to the phi. So you see that this goes as x to the phi, and uh, this is the p goes as x to the phi, n goes as x cube. So what is the equation of state then? That p is proportional to rho to the phi by three. So this is what is not. This is the equation of state for a completely degenerate non-relativistic gas. Right. So now. Now let's consider the other case where x is becoming much larger than one. We said x tend to infinity. Then fx goes as x to the four, and p goes as rho to the four by three. So you see that a a, a complete a degenerate, degenerate non-relativistic gas it is five by three, and for a degenerate relativistic gas it is four by three. Now you may imagine. Uh, that there is not much of a difference between 5 by 3 and 4 by 3. And in astronomy, we are used to very vast numbers, and the differences between them can also be very vast and without causing any problem to anybody. But here, this small little change from 5 by 2 to 4 by 3 is what introduces the Chandrasekhar limit. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show that to you in just a moment. So, but in general, if you have got an equation of state, as p is equal to k rho to the gamma, where k is a constant, gamma is a constant, and you can write gamma is equal to 1 plus 1 upon n. These are all definitions. And this is known as a polytropic equation of state. Okay, so, um, so in general, this, this kind of equation called a polytropic equation of state, and then uh, you've got gamma is equal to 5 by 3, which we had upstairs here, would mean n is equal to 3 by 2, and gamma is equal to 4 by 3 corresponds to n is equal to 3. And polytropic equations are very important in astrophysics because that uh, polytropic equation of state uh, can become a valid uh, equation of state in certain circumstances. For example, we have seen here for white dwarf for fully degenerate matter, and uh, polytropic equations they uh, the for the polytropic equation of state leads to a equation or a polytropic equation which has got all kinds of uh, interesting solutions. So this is already done, right? So now, uh, so the first part was uh, showing what is degeneracy, and uh, look, and we have worked out 
the equations of state for non relativistic and relativistic ones. So now we go to the second part. Okay, equally interesting is a mass radius relation for white box. So I told you already that for a main sequence star, the radius should roughly be proportional to the mass. Whereas uh, I also already indicated to you that for white dwarfs, the radius, uh, as mass increases, the radius decreases. So which leads to a very, which is very consequential. And now let us, uh, let us actually derive that in a very simple way. Now, uh, if I were in front of you, we are face to face, I would ask you, that do you recognize this equation? So you must, because it comes from the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, which we just revised. And then the approximate form of that equation can be written as P by M, where P is the pressure, M is the mass of the star, is approximately equal to G M by R square. Now for degenerate matter, in general for a polytropic equation of state, we have P goes as rho to the gamma. Okay, and what is rho? Rho gale goes as M by R Q to the gamma. Right, so therefore, P by M uh, and is approximately equal to M up raised to gamma minus 1 upon R to the 3 gamma. Right, so we have just derived this. This you can say is the left hand side of the hydrostatic equilibrium equation. Okay, which one? This P by M. It is this side. What is the right hand side? <coughs> The right hand side is the inward force of gravity, and which I'm just dropping the constants is equal to m by r to the four. So then I define the quantity f is equal to fg by fp. I'm just dividing one by the other, and which is equal to m raised to two minus gamma for r into three gamma minus four. Right? <clears throat> so and this quantity f now is equal to m raised to one by three into r. For gamma is equal to 5 by 3. And what is what does gamma is equal to 5 by 3 correspond to? It corresponds to fully degenerate non-relativistic matter. And for, <coughs> for gamma is equal to 4 by 3, which is fully a relate uh, is a fully is a fully degenerate relativistic matter, this goes as m to the 2 by 3. Because when you put gamma is equal to 4 by 3, uh, r drops off because this just becomes equal to 0. So R drops off, right? So so now what is what is the F is equal to the ratio of the outward pressure force and the inward gravitational force. So for equilibrium, what should you have? You should have F is equal to one. <coughs> so you see. Therefore, can somebody keep admitting these people because that distracts me because that panel comes right? Oh my God, yeah. See, there must be somebody, some other co-host looking at the screen. So please admit people as this as soon as they ask to be admitted because otherwise the panel comes up on my screen and distracts me. I can't read behind it. All right. <clears throat> In the non-relativistic case, F is equal to M to the 1 by 3. So supposing I give you a mass, you give me <coughs> an object like that uh, with mass m. Then, uh, then in order to have a hydrostatic equilibrium, what is the condition I need? I must have f is equal to 1, right? Because this condition must be satisfied. And so if you give me a mass, how can I ensure that this f is equal to 1? That is by having r goes as m to the minus 1 by 3. Right? So therefore, we have derived a mass radius relation for a fully degenerate non relativistic object. And then as mass increases, R decreases and the density increases. So you please understand this very carefully. Is that for the non relativistic objects, um, we have derived the relation, the scaling relation, that as mass increases, the radius decreases. Now let us see what happens for the relativistic case. Now for the case, it's equal to m to the 2 by 3. And you know, you please remember that there are all kinds of constants here, which I've ignored. So, so you, what does it mean? I want to make f is equal to 1. And if f is equal to 1, then that will correspond to a unique mass. 
Do you understand this? In this case, you give me any mass and I can give you a radius which will ensure equilibrium. Whereas you give me a radius, then I can find a mass which ensures equilibrium. But the point is that as you become relativistic, okay, then you are going to have a unique mass there. Then because equilibrium is possible only for a unique mass. Okay, and then what is that unique mass? It turns out it is just the Chandrasekhar limit, okay, which is h cross c g m raised to 3 by 2 times mp. You know that I, I already uh, showed you that uh, equation uh, right at the beginning of the thing. And so, therefore, uh, therefore you see, uh, we have come to this conclusion by considering the half a solar mass. So you give me such a mass, I can immediately find for you what is the radius. Now you give me a, a higher mass, I'll have a, I will have lower radius. And the higher the mass, the lower the radius. But you see that as I go on lowering the radius, the density is increasing. And as the density is increasing, and we have seen here, uh, as the density is increasing, the momentum will increase. Right, because you, you are going further and further and further out into the momentum space. And as the momentum keeps increasing, eventually the momentum become relativistic. The moment they become relativistic, I can no longer, I have to abandon this relation and go to this one. And when I go to that, there's an absolutely unique mass. So I can, if I exceed that mass, then this whole edifice crumbles. So Chandrasekhar said that there is a critical mass. And then if I increase, a, I go beyond the critical mass, then I really don't know what is going to happen. There are no equilibrium states possible, and the object will keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And maybe it reaches infinite density at some point. So um, so, so you see that we have already come here to the, to the concept of a Chandrasekhar limit. But there is one last thing left to do, is to say, what is... Uh, how do I derive this particular relation? Meaning, what is the, uh, how do I derive this relation? So that, uh, we'll take that step now. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, calculation. So, so far, uh, we have used the Pauli exclusion principle to come to this level. Now, now we are going to introduce uh, uh, the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So let's look at this. And so I'm going, I'm here I'm using everything that I have uh, taught you about for some time. So from the uncertainty principle, we know that delta x into delta p is approximately equal to h cross. Now what do I take for delta x? Okay, so delta x we take to be the interparticle distance. And we know that the interparticle distance is equal to n to the minus 1 by 3. And for delta p, I mean, we need some characteristic value, so we take that to be the <coughs> to be the this characteristic value uh, to be the Fermi momentum. So the, un the uncertainty principle requires that n to the minus one by three into p f is approximately equal to h cross. So p f is equal to h cross n to the one by three. That is equal to h cross, and what is n here? It is a particle number density. So that is equal to the total number of particles in the star divided by RQ. That's a particle number density. And that I can write as what the total number of particles is equal to total mass of the object <coughs> divided by the proton mass. So therefore, uh, so this is therefore PF is equal to H cross uh, <coughs> M to the 1 by 3 upon R and P to the and mp to the 1 by 3. So if this is the momentum, what is the pressure? The pressure is equal to <coughs> the number density of particles into the average velocity, uh, number density of particles into the average velocity into pf. Right? Uh, so, <coughs> so average, uh, because, uh, because uh, the pressure is simply the flux of momentum. So then you get here, now I got n, then what is the velocity? Here I'm considering the relativistic matter, 
relativistic degeneracy because I want to derive the Chandrasekhar Lefe. So V is approximately equal to uh, the speed of light and then I got PF. So you've got P is equal to N by R cube PFC that is M by R cube MP into this value and that is simply equal to M to the 4 by 3 <coughs> H cross C upon R4 MP to the 4 by 3. Right? So then, as usual, we go to FP, which is P by M, and which is this number, which can be this quantity, which can be easily derived from the <coughs> cal 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 calculation we have gone through. And then FP is equal to FG, means that this one is equal to GM by R to the 4. That means you finally get M is equal to h cross c upon g m p square raised to 3 by 2 into m p. So you see, uh, and uh, what is this value? So you just put in all the numbers, um, and uh, this is just fundamental constants. As I already told you, the Chandrasekhar limit is given completely in terms of fundamental constant. There is nothing astronomical on the right-hand side. The left-hand left, left -hand side is the astronomical value. You put in the constants, you'll get a value approximately equal to 2. So this hand waving calculation has uh, uh, <coughs> has given us that there must be a maximum mass. First, first the consideration of the poly exclusion principle led us to the concept that there must be a maximum mass, and that the uncertainty principle has allowed us to calculate what that maximum mass is. Now, this calculation, I believe, was first done by Landau, the same Landau from the Landau and Lipschitz series. Okay, and so then. Uh, he had done that independent of uh, Chandrasekhar's calculation. Chandrasekhar's calculation was very exact, and I will show you the contours of that calculation the next time. All right, so this is uh, the Chandrasekhar limit, and uh, the, we'll come to it uh, next time. Yeah. So what I want to do now is uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll go back to the other slides the next time. Actually, what happened was that uh, between yesterday afternoon and uh, this afternoon, yesterday night, this morning, uh, when I was going to Ayuka, and this afternoon, uh, when I was coming back from Ayuka, uh, I got caught in three traffic jams. And the traffic jams occurred because the President of India was in Pune today, and uh, he's staying in a place which is uh, along my path from my home to Ayuka. And because of these three traffic jams, I did not get time to key the equations. So therefore, I said that I'll do it the next time. So you see that these are completely unconnected events, but one has a con one has an effect on the other. Uh, the president's visit and my lecture too. All right. So now uh, we have been talking about white dwarfs. We know white dwarfs exist. We know that there are hundreds and thousands of them have been studied, and there are millions, hundreds of millions of them in the galaxy. So now you have to ask yourself the question as to how white dwarfs are formed. And for that, we have to go into stellar evolution theory. And uh, that, will, that will take me, to do it properly, will take me off track. So I'm just going to give you uh, just a few facts about those things, just qualitative facts. So uh, I'm, it's possible that somebody has covered that for you by now, or somebody will be doing it later. and. Uh, Mine is just a sketch. So when you've got, uh, when you've got the sun, the sun is presently on the main sequence. Okay, and as I told you, showed you the other day on the husband Russell diagram, a majority of the, a majority of the objects are on the, uh, majority of the stars on the main sequence. And by definition, an uh, object on the main sequence is converting in its interior hydrogen to helium. So, uh, so what happens to an object when it goes to the next phase of uh, fusion? We'll come to that in a moment. So, so if you look at the interior of the sun or any star of the main sequence, what you'll find is that there's a core. As, as, as I told you, when you go inwards, the temperature increases. You need at least a few billion Kelvin for, uh, for the fusion to start. At the center of the sun, it's about 15 billion Kelvin. So the fusion is going on very well. Now, it is not that the fusion goes on only exact R is equal to zero center. There is a region inside which is called the core <coughs> where the temperature is sufficiently high that hydrogen is fusing to helium. 
right? And, uh, as you go inwards, the process happens faster and faster. Uh, so then you have got, uh, then then you have got. Uh, so here, uh, the hydrogen is burning, right? Uh, burning in a matter of speaking. And what does the hydrogen get converted to? It gets converted to helium. And uh, the the mass of the helium nucleus is less than the mass of uh, the two protons and uh, two neutrons that it has got, uh, less than the mass of four protons, and therefore uh, energy is released. And that is the nuclear fusion energy. Now, uh, after this has gone on for a while, okay, what happens is that the inner part, the the <coughs> The inner part becomes helium uh, because helium is formed here, and the fusion is, happens in the outer parts. So you've got helium, and you've got a thin layer of hydrogen hydrogen burning around it. And when you go outside the thin layer, the temperature will be too less for burning to take place. And so now, uh, now you can imagine that after some time, then all the hydrogen, so which could be which is in the core where the temperature is sufficiently high. Uh, is exhausted, and you get only helium. And then there is no helium fusion because the temperature is only 50, uh, 50 Kelvin, 50 million Kelvin, which is lower than the temperature required for helium fusion. And therefore, the inner part starts cooling. As it cools, the pressure decreases. And when the pressure decreases, uh, the the net outward pressure force can no longer balance gravity, as a result of which the inner part Will start contracting, and the contract the contraction should go on and on and on. But you must understand that as the contraction proceeds, gravitational energy is being released because the gravitational energy is minus g m square by r, approximately. And so as r decreases, so the gravitational energy is becoming more negative, and therefore energy is being released. Now, which energy can it goes into heating up the matter? So it's a crazy thing, and uh, it going the the gravitational energy is becoming more and more negative, and therefore, in order to conserve energy, the thermal energy must increase, and therefore the temperature keeps increasing. Now, the temperature has has to increase about to about 30 million Kelvin, 30 or 40 million Kelvin. I've forgotten the exact number for uh, for the helium fusion to take place, and uh, if and that will be reached. Only if the mass of the core is sufficiently large, and the mass of the core is related to the mass of the whole star. So let's assume <clears> that the mass of the core is insufficient to trigger the fusion of helium. Okay, then the then the then the then the uh, collapse continues relentlessly. But then we know mm -hmm. that as the density increases, eventually the matter will become degenerate, which I have uh, very forcefully explained to you. And as it becomes degenerate. The inner parts will become a white dwarf, and what will that white dwarf consist of? The white dwarf will consist of uh, just helium. So it's a pure helium white dwarf. And what happens to the outer region? The outer regions are thrown off in explosion because there is violent release of energy when the inner core collapses, and the outer so just thrown off, and they become what is known as a hydrogen, it <coughs> as a planetary nebula. Now, supposing, on the other hand, the mass of the core is sufficiently large, then what you will get is that as the core collapses, the temperature eventually reaches a point at which helium fusion is possible. Okay, then helium fusion starts, the core again stabilizes, the collapse stops, and then so you have get then a star yeah, in which the in the the outer layers, as I said, they are. <coughs> Here the outer layers expand; they don't explode, and then it becomes a red giant, and then it comes back. There. Okay, so so you get a star. You'll again get a star in which uh, the helium is burning at the center. That will be surrounded by a thin shell of hydrogen, which could be burning, and then outside that there is no burning. Now, uh, because helium fusion is taking place, the star is again on the main sequence. But it is not the same hydrogen main sequence that is considering. It is a slightly displaced from it, and it's called the helium main sequence. As a relatively small number of stars will be on the helium main sequence. Now, when the helium is exhausted, there will again be a collapse which is taking place. When this collapse, if there is sufficient mass 
the next the next stage of burning takes place otherwise it will collapse to form um, a carbon nitrogen oxygen white cloud because when helium burns you get from it carbon nitrogen oxide so for the smallest for the least massive stars you get a helium white cloud for the more massive stars you get a carbon nitrogen oxygen white cloud and so on and so forth so for the most massive stars what will happen is that when all the cycles of burning are finished you got iron inside core of iron and then you got you see that the progressive takes silicon sulfur oxygen carbon hydrogen helium hydrogen and so forth right so so it is like a onion shell structure the center you got iron and then you got these other elements surrounding them shells so then what happens after iron it is not possible for you to go beyond iron because as you know that the bytic the nuclear bytic energy curve has a maximum at i57 so you can't go beyond that uh, because helium because nuclear fusion will no longer be exothermic so that is the end of the show as far as stars are concerned once you form iron inside it's finished then when the uh, when the core cools it will collapse and now when it collapses uh, the the core is so massive it's much more massive than the helium uh, that that the chandrasekhar limit and therefore collapse continues chandrasekhar did not know what will happen if the collapse continues okay but then uh, we now know that you will either get a neutron star which is made up of neutrons okay or you get a black hole which depends upon the mass of the star right so here uh, you got the evolutionary curve you start from the main sequence and then when you finish the, you are you are sitting on one point of the main sequence you remain there until all the hydrogen is exhausted okay then <clears throat> star starts expanding the core is contracting and then you go into the again a contraction and so on and so forth until for the most massive stars you'll have a supernova explosion and neutron star is formed if you're not the most massive then you'll form a white dwarf and the white dwarf will actually we have seen is that it is sitting in this particular region of the spectrum so uh, when the white dwarf is finally formed you get this very beautiful structure The, the huge explosion because I told you that the amount of biting energy for a white dwarf is like ten to the minus ten to the fifty earth, so which means that that much energy is released, and then you <clears throat> then you get this beautiful structure which is known as a planetary nebula. So here, uh, this is about twenty three hundred light years away. Oh, okay, it's called it's called the ring nebula, and then <clears throat> if you if you form either a neutron star or a black hole, and then then you have got uh, This kind of a large explosion. This is all of you will certainly have seen this image. It's called the Crab Nebula, and so which is a remnant of a supernova explosion which took place in 10 to the 54. It did not take place in 10 to 54 AD. It was first seen on the Earth in 10 to 54 AD. Okay, so <clears throat> so it happened because this the distance is uh, 6300 light years. So it happened 6300 years before 10 to the 10 to 54 AD. This is the crab nebula. So you see that we have seen how white dwarfs are formed. Let's look at, look at this table. So consider an object with a certain initial mass. If it is less than point one percent of the mass of the sun, <clears throat> then uh, you see that you form a cloud like this, and it will be collapsing under its own weight. And if the mass is so small, then it collapses to what is known as a planet. Okay, because the planet is not a star, and the, it's the crystalline structure of the matter which holds the thing apart. So when I stand on the floor here, I don't fall into the the center of the earth simply because <clears throat> the electric, the electric, uh, the electrostatic interaction between my feet and the atoms in the ground. So they are keeping, uh, they are they're preventing me from falling. Then uh, when the mass approaches point one solar mass in this range, ten to the minus one. To eight into ten to the minus ten to the minus two into eight into ten to the minus two, then you get an object which is known as a brown dwarf. Okay, so the brown dwarfs, uh, these are uh, these are these are not massive enough to actually for helium fusion to be initiated, but they are. <clears throat> uh, but there is some residual fusion to take place, and uh, uh, and they are called brown dwarfs. They, they emit the infrared. And I believe that the first one, the first actual detection of a brown dwarf, was made by Shrivas Kulkarni. 
Okay, then, uh, <coughs> then you have got here uh, in this range, uh, the initial mass is very low range. You should get a helium white dwarf. But there's a catch there uh, is that uh, a star with an initial mass of only 0.25 solar masses, uh, it, its lifetime will be longer than the lifetime of the universe, so that it will really not collapse. So then in order to have a helium white dwarf, what you require is uh, <coughs> Yeah, you need to enhance the collapse through exchange of matter between that star and other star. It can get pretty complicated. Then the simplest case, 0.25 to 8 solar masses. So like our sun, for example. So we'll end up forming a carbon oxygen white dwarf. So when the sun finishes its entire thing, in about, how old is it now? It's about 5 billion years old. And in another 5 billion years, um, it will have finished everything and then it will have become uh, carbon oxygen white loss. And the solar system, of course, will have been wiped out in the explosion before that. Then in this range, you get an oxygen, nitrogen, magnesium white dwarf. And then for mass greater than about 12 solar masses, you get a neutron star. And for mass greater than about 40 solar masses, you get a black hole. Okay, and in these two cases, you get a supernova explosion. So these limits are not hard limits. Okay, meaning that uh, this is a hard limit, as I told you, because as the temperature, as the mass goes below this, fusion cannot be started at all. So you can't have stars below this. But then these are not hard limits, and they all depend upon the details, assumptions of the theory, and so on. Right, so, uh, so I think I'll stop there. I'll reach the end of my time today, and uh, I'll be happy to answer some questions. So I see a raised hand. Is that all right? I think you can ask. Dibakar Dutta. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, yeah, hello. Am I audible, sir? Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. So my question is that uh, there are two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, in uh, all the lectures, when uh, your lecture also today saw that uh, in the last slide only, uh, where you have shown that different uh, solar masses compared to the mass of the star, where the, star, the mass will start to form the star. If they, they are uh, under certain limits, then you will have this white dwarf or brown dwarf and other uh, dwarfs. And then after that, if it becomes more than that, then there will be a supernova explosion. And there will be, uh, I understood that. The question is that in all the cases where uh, the nuclear fission reaction occurs inside the star. We are yes. having uh, elements which is formed, the maximum element which is formed, that is iron. Yes. In, in Earth, we can see that there are elements which are more than uh, the mass of an iron. I mean, yes. is there, there are other, other elements are there. So my yes. question is, where elements are coming from? Which oh, that, and you see that, uh, uh, that's a good question, but you answered long ago and uh, proven some years ago. Uh, is that these are all <coughs> the other elements require much higher temperature to be formed, and so they are formed typically uh, in uh, supernova during the supernova explosion, for example. And then it is also long speculated that we must form some of these elements when there is a merger between neutron stars. Okay, now such mergers uh, are not uh, generally visible, uh, but LIGO detected a neutron star neutron star merger. And then there were all kinds of observations. And then when they, when the detailed observations were made, many of these theories were vindicated. Okay, that e even during the merger of neutron stars, you can form these heavy elements. Okay. Any other question? I don't see any questions in the blue sheet either. Okay. Uh, now I can read two questions here. So one question is, uh, what is degeneracy exactly? Now, uh, degeneracy, as I explained to you in detail, 
you say matter is degenerate okay when uh, when when you are required to use quantum mechanics to find its equation of state that's so an ideal what is what do you exactly mean by the ideal gas do you mean by the ideal gas is somewhere the, the, the equation of state is p is equal to rho kt uh, by r okay uh, rho uh, rho kt by mu f p so that is the equation of state so when when quantum mechanics is required then you require uh, for the dirac statistics and then you say matter is degenerate then uh, are there any luminosity differences in different element consisting of white bars i don't understand the uh, okay before that some say that if the star is greater than 1.4 solar mass then it will be neutron star is greater than 3 solar mass become black hole uh, now you see uh, uh, I, there could there could be some uh, misunderstanding here confusion here it is like this the mass the chandrasekhar limit is 1.4 solar masses so what what does that mean it means that you can't have a white dwarf with a mass more than 1.4 solar masses but chandrasekhar did not know uh, what would be the state of such objects we know now that they can form a neutron star now the mass limits that i was talking about are not the limits of uh, the white dwarf mass they are the limits of the initial star Okay, so these are the Chandrasekhar limit is on the limit is the mass of the white dwarf, whereas the limits we are talking about is the mass of the initial star. And now, are there any luminosity differences in different elements consisting white dwarfs? Uh, I don't understand the meaning of this question. Uh, do that person want to actually ask the question? Okay, if not, uh, then uh, is done. So next time, what I'm going to do? Yes, there is Shubham Maharana. Yeah, please ask the question. Shubham, please ask question. Yeah. Sir, am I audible? Yeah. Sir, I wanted to know that like there is helium white dwarf and carbon oxygen white dwarf. Are there any luminosity? difference between them what do you mean luminosity difference uh, i exactly want to ask that uh, is there any pattern like there is mass ranging means but yeah, particular okay. yeah. You, 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 what you want what you want maybe your question is the following that if i give you two white dwarfs and say one is a one is a helium white dwarf the other is a carbon nitrogen white dwarf how can i distinguish between them Okay, you can distinguish between them uh, by looking at the spectrum of the white dwarf, because there are the different elements which are present, and some of them will be there in the atmosphere of the white dwarf. And when you take a spectrum, you will actually see the presence of these elements. Okay, so you are talking about luminosity differences. You are talking about the spectral differences. And needless to say, white dwarfs of different kinds will have different luminosity in the sense that the amount of energy that they Emit per second will be different, and I will come to a little bit of that in my third lecture. Okay, all right. That's the end of the questions. So next time I'll probably devote between. Let's see how much I'm emitting the whole lecture, but I'll try to avoid that. So I'll do, I want to go into black holes, depending upon how long it takes. Because I I have not been going. I have not been hurrying through things because. Uh, These are all difficult concepts, and I thought that it is better to explain for me to explain them to you in detail, and you can ponder over what I have said. I give a list of textbooks which you can take a look at, and then you'll know more about it. And you'll also find a lot of stuff on the internet itself. There will be a lot of notes, and there will be a lot of uh, uh, articles on these things. So, because you may not have access to the textbooks, but you'll have access to all these articles. And I know a couple of good ones, and I'll lead you to them. Then Akshat has a question. Okay, we'll stop here.
yeah if any of the participants have more questions they can either continue in the next lecture or they can uh, send uh, the questions via the google form and uh, yeah you can address them in the next lecture thank you very much thank you <coughs> thank you everybody for attending the lecture thank you debrati i log off now yeah sure